another introduction. Um, I think that was quite an interesting story. Just briefly about me, um, Marcus Shuri from Harris Hagen. We're a specialist gambling law firm in the city of London. And I already have to apologize. I do not have any kind of slideshow here because normally I break these machines. I hope I'm not going to break this one. But I did produce a handout for you, which I hope you're going to find helpful. Um, we're going to talk about the US indictments and the effect it has on the affiliate marketplace. But I think in order to address that, we need to look at the marketplace in general and look at the gambling industry, how the gambling industry is changing post Black Friday, if you want. Um, and I think the best thing would be, I would like to start with an overview first of what happened with the indictments and then followed about the aftermath of the three main issues which I consider to be the aftermath of these indictments. Number one would be changes in lobbying. Number two, possibility of having a license in the States one day. And number three, how the marketplace in Europe and the States is changing and affecting each other and how this may have an effect on the affiliate marketplace as well. Um, I think it's not going to take me too long to run through these points, and maybe afterwards we're going to open the floor and have a discussion about all the main issues that we're going to discuss. Um, if I look first at the indictments, I think you know, going back to when Uyghur was introduced in 2006, it was a bit of a strange law to actually start with because they coupled two laws together, amending the Wire Act and wanting to introduce a new law to ban any kind of payment processing for online gambling. Um, Some had got through, and I think that was more of a shock to me than having the events of Black Friday. Um, which weren't so much unexpected as a lot of people seem to appear to be shocked today. Um, the other thing with Uyghur was also the surprising thing about it, that once it came into force, all the big online gambling operators, most of them from Europe, actually left immediately without even challenging, challenging, the, challenging the law. If you think about how online operators behave in Europe, they stay in the market until the bitter end. They fight it out in the European Court of Justice, and even then they may not leave. Well, in the States, once the law came out, all the big ones were gone, and followed by the payment processes en suite. In a way, they created actually fait accompli in the States, where they actually left the market there, only to, if you want, the brave few ones who continued on offering online gambling in the States. And the effect this has on the affiliates back then was that they didn't actually have a choice to choose from. Um, you have a few players on the market which were conducting illegal gambling, and the protection that US affiliates would probably have were more or less non-existent. Um, in addition, and that's the surprising thing, and that's why I was surprised that nobody actually picked it up with Uyghur, was that um, Uyghur doesn't even define a definition of illegal gambling. We actually don't know what illegal gambling for Americans is, whether it's poker, whether it's not poker, it has never been picked up. The only thing that's defined is in the Wire Act, which relates to betting. And I think that was probably one of the excuses that was often used to say, actually, it's not defined. We can still go there. Um, but as a lawyer and having worked in the industry for several years, the first thing we would always recommend to clients, whether they're affiliates or whether they're gambling operators, we're happy to make a risk assessment of all the countries in Europe, whether you can market there, whether you can enter there, but just do never go to the States after Uyghur. Um, some people just didn't quite listen, and the Black Friday events weren't really a surprise. The only surprise was that they happened in April, and April isn't a very convenient time for lawyers because they're always busy then. But having now looked at the indictments, what is more surprising is actually what the indictments also include. It's not so much of a breach in gambling regulations. I think we're all, I wouldn't say we're used to that, but it wouldn't be something that surprises us. What was more surprising was all the additional accusations, if you want, or allegations. And if they are true, then it is quite um, an enormous detriment for all of us in the gambling sector. These are the allegations of fraud, setting up other companies, setting up bogus shops for bicycles and golf, uh, flower shops, etc. Now, if that, if that is really the case, if that is proven, um, you know, there's actually no excuse anymore. And I don't actually even know how US affiliates can justify it under these circumstances. It's going to be a very difficult task. And this is where it triggers to Europe, because if we look at gambling regulators here, if you want to stay reputable as a gambling regulator, you need to take a certain degree of action if you have these serious allegations of money laundering and fraud, let alone that someone has breached gambling relations somewhere. That, to a degree, gambling regulators may understand that, but to say that you've actually really conducted criminal action is something that any reputable gambling operator and regulator here in Europe must actually look into. And I'm therefore not really surprised that Alderney took a step and had a look at it, although they're always saying it's not really directly related, but to close both eyes to allegations like that would actually be to the detriment of any regulator here as well. 
the effect it had, of course, on affiliates in the States was that many of them weren't actually getting paid, or the payment slowly to go through on their accounts up to two months after the Black Friday. There isn't really any recourse from the legal side to take. But what I, what I found quite funny as a lawyer was when I, when I read on the websites the letters or the emails sent out by the indicted company saying, based on our legal advice, we stop payment. And I found this interesting, to say the least, because it looks like suddenly the law is worth something, and suddenly they're listening to when payment should be stopped or not. Don't find the way and manner it happened very appropriate, but from the legal perspective, I fully understand that they had to stop payment, which isn't really the best thing to do. But having said that, and now having gone through quickly on um, the US indictments, I think now coming to the main issues, what happens in the aftermath, and how does that affect us? Um, as I said, there are three main issues. I think the lobbying activities have changed. Would there be a gambling license in the future of the States? Would be quite interesting. And thirdly, how are the market dynamics in Europe and the States, with the big players there, are affecting the future of online gambling? Um, if I look at lobbying, before Black Friday, there was always quite intense lobbying to legalize online gambling. But the question is, who were the players? Well, the big European companies who pulled out weren't really very keen on lobbying too much for that as long as the other guys stayed in. Because in a way they felt that's an unfair advantage. Um, and if you look at the majority of financing that actually went through the lobbies and went through lobby groups there and interest groups, um, I think it's quite normal that the people who are mostly interested in legalizing online gambling were the people who were there and they were the people who contributed the most. So after Black Friday, this kind of inflow of money probably stopped. Um, at the moment, you can't really quite assess how much was paid or not because everything is not in the open in the States if it comes to lobbying activities because the trade groups do not have to disclose. Um, I do hope that the trade groups aren't going to have any kind of damage from that because they, they have other members as well and they are promoting a good cause in legalizing gambling there. Um, but normally with the States, it's always your guilty by association. And it is therefore no surprise that now land-based American companies have actually set up their own trade groups. For example, it's called Fair Play USA, which has now been set up by MGM and Caesars. To, and you know, in a way, when you look at it, it's quite natural because the new trade group doesn't have any associations with the bad past, and we can have a fresh start now. And interesting enough, um, most online gambling operators in Europe, the big ones, are very, very keen to enter and are now even more keen because now they consider the Black Friday to be actually a clean slate. Um, as we have now a clean slate and we can now start fresh, even the lobbying has changed because now the laws that are maybe being introduced, are being discussed, are actually catered for, for the online gambling operators in Europe and for the land-based operators in the States, both of which are actually very large players. So you can actually imagine if there would be a law in the future, the outcome of that law will probably cater more for the U US land-based casino operators and to um, the European large online gambling operators who are very keen to enter the market as soon as possible. Um, which brings us to the next point. Um, what kind of law, will there ever be a law in the States? There have already been so many drafts, um, and people have actually already given up whether it's going to happen or it isn't going to happen. But at the moment, there seems to be really a kind of, if you want, understanding amongst all sides that it will be legalized. What will be legalized apparently appears to be online poker, but it's all still uh, out in the ether there. Why I do have a good feeling about this is that this time you have the right guys pulling together, i.e. the land-based operators in the States who from the beginning were actually absolutely against online gambling and slowly got around when, once they saw how fabulous it works in Europe. And you have all the big online gambling operators who are heavily regulated now in Europe having very similar grounds like the US American gambling operators who would like to enter the market together. So having a lobby from these two big parties for the same kind of legalization, accepting probably that only online poker would be legalized and nothing else, seems to actually indicate that there's an understanding across the board at the moment. And what emphasizes this understanding, I don't know how interested you are in American politics, but when you hear that um, Kyle, who's always was opposed to gambling and who's fingerprints you can actually see all over the Uyghur. And Reed, who's on the other side who wants to legalize gambling, both issued a letter together, an open letter condemning legalizing gambling on a state level. Now that's quite interesting. I mean, why should these two go together? Well, one of the reasons is that in the, 
in various states in the US, the states on, them, on their own wanted to legalize online gambling just on a state level. Um, as an example, Nevada, and I think that's going to be quite interesting for affiliates because we even in Europe haven't reached that stage of legal, legal, legalizing for that. Uh, one thing that Nevada introduced was a draft law, which isn't going to be enforced, um, but in which they, and the, now you can actually see the lobbying here, which they would allow online gambling operators from Europe in. Now that, that's quite a nice surprise. And secondly, they also propose to introduce licenses for affiliate marketing. Now that is a stage that we actually have never really reached in Europe. Well, we have, for example, in England, uh, we would probably regulate on the advertising side and saying you can't do this, you can do that, you can't advertise here. But to really ask mar affiliates to actually apply for a license is a very interesting development, which may really be due to the events of Black Friday, because after, if you want, the shock or aftershock, and when people start to think about it, they all know probably these companies couldn't have grown so much without affiliate marketing in the state, so let's just regulate them, them as well. In a way, I don't really find regulations of affiliates, well, I haven't seen the law yet, but I don't really find it such a terrible thing. In a way, it actually protects affiliates, because if you think then you have an exclusivity, should the idea of Nevada really trigger into federal, if it comes into effect, or should Nevada really implement its own laws? You can actually think that you are protected if you apply for a license in Nevada, because all gambling operators will have to use you. So what, where does that leave us with Black Friday and the events in the States? I, I'm sure that you would need a clean slate as well. That basically means whatever you were doing before, stop doing it, because you, who knows when it's going to be legal and if it's legal, and the Americans insist on licensing and regulating affiliate marketing, then you have very bad cards if you don't get the house in order now. And maybe it's even too late. I don't know. That really is left to the Americans. Then. But having looked at that, um, and speaking about Reed and Kyle, it really appears, especially now because Kyle's on the committee for the super committee on budget, uh, which probably will assess where to get money from in the States. And, you know, gambling is probably one of the main sectors lobbied now by the land based industry there, heavily lobbied by EU operators. It sounds that. This seems to be the way to go. I understand that as long as online poker is permitted, nothing else should be permitted then. Um, as far as I understand, even from clients, it's not going to happen in the next year or two. It's probably not before the end of 2012 until the next Congress comes into place. But that something is moving in that direction seems to be quite evident now. And the forces seem to go in that direction. Um, that's enough of our predictions on new laws, whether they come into force or not. Um, which leads me to the third point. What is actually happening on the marketplace in general and what are the Europeans doing? Now, Europe in a way is already consolidating. It, it already has quite an established gambling industry. And the, well, the funny thing is that we went through all the EU freedom to provide services, all the discussions. And I think this was the time, if you want to call it the wild west in Europe, when online gambling operators actually had the chance to grow because they can just enter markets, not pay taxes, claim the freedom to provide services, probably sometimes win, sometimes they change the law, and you did suddenly get very big players in the field. Well, these days are gone, because now we have national licensing regimes, which seem to be widely accepted in Europe, and you know, one after the other is introducing. Denmark is still on the pains of getting it through, Spain is introducing it, Italy has it, and by having national licensing regimes in order to control operations in the country, um, Strangely enough, they're actually going against competition because once you have 27 licenses across Europe, which small operator or small affiliate can actually afford having the 27 licenses across Europe? So in a way, they are actually consolidating automatically because now you only can really have the big players affording to really cater to all these jurisdictions across Europe. And the development is probably a diversification into B2B um, and B2C with many gambling operators now saying, well, actually, we're just going to offer you the services. We have the service located in tax friendly jurisdictions. You take it and you become B2C and you apply for a license. We have nothing to do with that. And that seems to be at the moment the trend that's happening in Europe. Unfortunately, that really means we are only going to have big players and bigger players. And we're not really going to have a lot of small operators here in Europe anymore. If we look at what's happening in the States with who is really lobbying and who really now wants finally online gambling? And it's mostly in Nevada with the majority of land-based casinos there now really pushing forward to actually open the law. So if you think about what kind of law, what kind of market opening, we're just talking about big players, both heavily regulated, 
both very interested in opening the market but dividing it up amongst themselves. So is there any space for newcomers? I doubt it. Is there any space for small companies to actually grow in the States? I doubt it as well. And how does that look if you think about the effect for affiliates then? Well, the effect for affiliates is, on the positive side, you probably have dealings with highly regulated operators who will probably not breach the law very easily because their own license is at risk. On the other hand, you do have a very big inflexibility in movement and you probably have as affiliates, as Nevada is showing, probably additional regulations that you have to comply with. Where does that put US affiliates versus European affiliates? In a way, and that's you know the, the, the perverted thing about this, EU affiliates may have a clean slate to start in the States or to go into the States, have the feelers out there, uh, and US affiliates probably have to diversify at the moment and conduct purely legal activities until such law comes into force. Um, I think that was it for me in summary. I hope that gave you a brief overview. And if you have any questions, please do ask. Marcus, th Marcus thank you very much. I sat over there just so I could hear from the speakers a little bit better. Um, but uh, some interesting, interesting points. Do we have some questions from the audience before I, before I tuck in? None? Well, let me, let, me, let me scrap with you a little bit here, Marcus. Um, you're talking about federal, federal legislation yeah. throughout your entire speech. What do you think about state-by-state -state legislation? In November of this year, New Jersey's got two items on its, yeah. um, on its uh, ballot. Both are referendum items. Mm. One is to legalize sports betting within the state of New Jersey, mm. which would make it the second state in America to have a, a, a full sports betting yeah. um, proposition. Um, so far, only Nevada has complete sports betting in the United States, and Delaware has limited sports mm. betting through parlays. And the second uh, issue on the ballot is online gaming. So it's mm. actually looking at its original online gaming legislation mm. and putting it to the people, saying, people of New Jersey, do you want online gaming? Yeah. Don't you think that the states will have an advantage over the federal government and Reed and Kyle uh, when it comes to legislating iGaming? Well, you, you actually are going to have to look at who the players in the game are. It is not of advantage to any online gambling operator to just go for state by state. That is highly restrictive. Um, most operators would be in support of a federal legislation, but as it looks like any federal legislation would probably be purely focused on online poker. If there is leeway for any state to legalize other areas of gambling, that may very well be the case. Um, but I doubt honestly whether that is going to be a great benefit. I'm gonna have to fight with you a little I'm gonna have to fight with you a little bit more. I, I disagree with you. I think we're talking of, you are talking about Europe and mm. how iGaming will be for the privileged few that are large enough to operate in every European yeah. jurisdiction. This is not the case. Historically that's never happened with gaming. With gaming historically you've got regional mm. and uh, national companies who have become big in their jurisdictions but have generally fail to expand outside of their jurisdiction. Notable examples of people who have gone global are probably, um, there are very few, Genting has gone yeah. global. Uh, Harris has a couple of properties outside of, well, a couple of properties in Britain as well as the properties in the United States. Um, but generally speaking, uh, uh, gaming, land-based gaming, develops on a, on a regional basis because you just get good at licensing regionally and it's very hard to go into other jurisdictions where you don't have a lot of clout. Um, why do you think that iGaming will develop differently? Um, it's not about why I think that iGaming wouldn't go that way. I think that there's no other option and federal doesn't go through and federal doesn't mind legalizing state by state or allowing state to push that through. Um, I just don't really think that that's the ideal scenario. It's the, sim the same thing across Europe, the same thing with the states. It would be better to have a federal legislation and not a regional, if you want, the state by state. Um, it may very well happen that one state would probably start it first and then it would have a trigger effect. Whether the federal government would actually then allow intrastate gambling, if two have actually legalized the same gambling, that's another question. It's an interesting scenario. Um, a lot of people would argue that the states have the right to offer internet gaming, mm -hmm. and if the federal government were to issue iGaming uh, on a federal basis, the state attorney generals mm. would actually go to the Supreme Court and say, no, this is a state's right issue. We want it for our coffers. So it's, a, it's an interesting mm. quandary. Um, but 
generally speaking, I mean, the first horse out of the gate is usually, you know, the one that wins in these kind of races. So if the states decide to go with federal legislation, then uh, it's likely that for a number of years, uh, you'll just the states yeah. will just live with federal regulation. You know, I think well, what I find more interesting than New Jersey is actually the new Nevada draft law because they are actually opening up purely for online poker, but they're also allowing all the Europeans in. They want to be the first in there in order that the Europeans have all the service in Nevada. Because once you have them, they are not going to really move around. So I think that, that is definitely a draft law to look out for. Let's look at, let's look at that law. Everyone's probably familiar that Nevada has... Uh, issued some legislation <clears throat> which would allow uh, online gaming to exist for the state of Nevada. However, it, when I look at it, it looks like the worst piece of legislation I've ever seen in my entire life. Mm. Because what they've done is they said, if a federal law should exist that allows yeah. iGaming, then Nevada laws now will um, abide by the federal law yeah. and allow iGaming. That's a ridiculous yeah. law to pass. Why? Because all it does I, is I, limit your options. No, Why? God's name, will you ever pass that? No, but I, I think you can already notice the fingerprints, if you want, of who or by or who was supporting that law, because it's basically much better to have it on federal level. Um, but talking about that, I think Nevada has another problem, which has to do with, with its own regulators. Um, the regulators there are purely land-based by culture, which is understandable. And they, I think they have quite enormous difficulties in understanding the concept of online gambling. And even today, you do have many online gambling operators who would like to start strategic alliances with American land-based operators as a, as a healthy transgression. Um, in a way, it is not really quite working yet. You just have very few examples of that. The reason is that the, land, the regulators in Nevada are still applying the land-based standards and the land-based law to online gambling, which isn't quite working. As an example, we have a client who is regulated in Nevada, and you know they said to me, well, Marcus, it doesn't really matter. Whatever you tell them about EU law, the regulator there just is concerned, is it legal, isn't it legal? And they would probably just call the regulator in Finland and say, is it legal to offer online gambling? He's going to say no, so that's the end of the story. And with that attitude, you can't merge, or you can't actually go into any strategic alliance with any online gambling operator in Europe, because probably everyone has breached some law somewhere without knowing. Um, and for that sense, it is one of the major stepping stones now that the Nevada regulators need to take to actually get the law in, in order and to actually understand how online gambling would work. It's interesting. You mentioned, you mentioned companies that have a real interest in getting a, 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 a federal bill in, or yeah. a, a countrywide bill passed, a federal bill that would allow them to take bets from every state. Um, yeah, a lot of I, uh, sorry, a lot of traditional land-based gaming companies in the states have put a valuation on the potential of online gaming onto their balance sheet. Yeah, and if I gaming opens on a state-by-state -state basis, there are 50 states. And okay, mm. they're all different sizes, but let's just say that each state is worth one fiftieth mm. of that federal legislation of that federal value. Um, you wipe a lot of money off the balance sheet when you have to go state by state, especially if you're not operating in every single state yeah, in, in the union. They're also probably regulated in each state if they're already present there. And they have to satisfy with each state that anything they're doing with any European online gambling operator is caution legal from beginning to But end. they do that now. Um, w yes, and it's very difficult. I think if you see one of the cases where um, one of the companies in the states merged with a online gambling operator, and now the online gambling operator has to shut their market just in order to satisfy Nevada regulators. So, you know, this attitude must change, otherwise no, no one would be interested. Do we have some questions from the audience? Do we have no questions from the audience? If you don't have a question, raise your hand. There you go. Here's a question. Hi, Marcus. Um, oh. I'm Stella Dalton from GAMCARE, the uh, charity for player protection in the UK. Um, I'm interested, you talked about the proposal um, likely for affiliates to be licensed um, in the States. What would that license look like? So for example, in for, for our interest, would that mean um, there'd need to be uh, social responsibility and player protection uh, within that license? 
licensed in, uh, through their gambling commission, similar to our UK gambling commission. Yes, and okay. once you're approved and licensed through there, you probably have to meet the same standards of how you're advertising. That will be controlled by the gambling commission then. To whom are you advertising? Who are your clients? What have you done in the past? Are you advertising for someone who you're not allowed to advertise for because they're conducting illegal activities, etc.? So in a way, I actually think that is a very interesting step forward. Um, it may not be necessary in Europe because we're quite heavily regulated in any event, but considering the American market, it probably is a very wise move. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Marcus, Marcus you, you couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> Um, no, it's ridiculous to try to, to try to license affiliates on an individual basis because affiliate deals don't yeah. just occur with your traditional affiliates. Affiliated yeah. deals can occur with mass media uh, yeah, agencies, um, newspapers, uh, national magazines, mm. radio, television. All that generally can be mm. negotiated on the CPA basis. Mm. And um, if the affiliate market continues to be as strong as it is, then that's probably how it will develop in the state. It'll be performance-based. That's just that's just the future of the world because the internet exists. Do you know? Um, do you know? I think I probably would disagree with you because I would just look at it as the same with the regulating online gambling operators. Um, if you have an affiliate who probably doesn't follow the law uh, by probably having advertising that is in breach of the country, it is very helpful to have a tool in order to regulate these affiliates. No, for for. Definitely, if you advertise something that's illegal from a, a, a media outlet that exists within a certain jurisdiction, yeah. then there will be consequences. But that doesn't necessarily follow that you should have everyone licensed. I, the the licensing part, I think, is really interesting. I think it is quite interesting because with, um, that is the legal debate uh, that went through Europe. We can't regulate without having a license from someone, and that's why we got the creation of the national licensing regimes. Um, for example, France said we can't really regulate, we don't have authority to do it without him being licensed in that country. And that is part of, part of the truth. Um, so one of my clients who's an affiliate, um, he got approached, and he's not in England, but he got approached by the Gambling Commission because he was advertising to um, English uh, residents, but he also had on his affiliate site um, websites from casinos that aren't in Europe. Interesting enough, they're mostly in the States. Um, and he was approached with them saying, you're not allowed to do this, you need to shut down. Now, they actually don't have an enforcement procedure against that because he's not licensed or he's not registered in England. Um, but the advice, of course, was I think it's better to either shut it down or you know, get rid of the casinos that you're not allowed to advertise in the UK because they're breaching advertising regulations. Um, I do not find it a big burden to actually license or approve affiliates because it's actually security for themselves. Any other questions from our audience? Yes, hold on one sec, I'll come down with the microphone. Hi, my name is Isaac, I'm an affiliate, a new affiliate, and I was, can you please just make it more clear regarding if you just advertise, uh, not really advertise on any, any media, but just describe information about the US market on your website, is it legal or illegal for you to do that as an affiliate? Are you speaking about Finland in particular now, or well, what are you? Mean? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Are you speaking about Finland or no, about no. the U.S. market? About the U.S. market. Yeah. Uh, yes, any kind of advertising of U.S. in the U.S. Um, would be considered illegal. Yes, aiding and abetting a criminal offence. Marcos, once again, we have to talk about this. No, you're wrong. <laughs> in what does, what does the Unlawful Internet Gaming Enforcement Act do? It makes it a federal crime to take payment for something that's illegal, yeah. for illegal online yeah. gaming. Now, that, the, the predicate for that must be that there's illegal online gaming taking mm. place, which requires that there's a state law mm. that forbids online gaming. Now, there are something like 15, 14, 15 states mm. that have statutes against online mm. gaming. So, I have to disagree with you and say no. In the majority of the states, because there's no legislation for online gaming, UEGA actually cannot apply because it's drafted to make a federal crime out of something that's a state crime. Well, what do you, you think know, about that? Uh, no, um, it's nice that we disagree. Um, I disagree insofar because once you actually get into payments, and you, why are you advertising anything in the states? Once you get into payments, uh, and once you get paid for that, then I would consider this to be illegal, yes. 
Any other audience questions? No, Marcos, thank you very much. We'll argue thank some you. more later. Thanks.